So we have about 200 attendees and we'll, we'll just be waiting for a moment as everyone enters. Okay. The They're not going to be able to fit in my living room. <laughs> Romy, just one last check. So if there are questions, people put that in the question and answer box or in a chat box. I thought it was question and answer, right? Yes, Q&A would be best. Mm -hmm. And is somebody going to monitor that or do you want me to look at that too? No, we'll monitor that for you. Yeah, good, thank you. That makes it much, much easier. We can give it another roughly minute. Gabby, we've hit something of a plateau. I don't know if you want to. Okay. Right. The story of my life. <laughs> okay, should we get started then? Let's do it. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's Walter Monk Memorial Lecture um, that is actually happening on Walter's birthday. Um, today's speaker, the second um, in our series, is Larry Meyer from. Um, the University of New Hampshire. And I'd like to introduce him a little bit. So Larry is a distinguished professor and director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. He received a PhD from Scripps, actually in marine geophysics in 1997. And he was co-advised by um, Wolf Berger and Fred Spies, two very different fields. After being selected as an astronaut candidate finalist for NASA's first class of mission special, uh, specialist, Larry went on to a postdoc at a school of oceanography at the University of Rhode Island, where he worked on er the early development of the jet, sonar, and problems of deep sea sediment transport and paleo-oceanography. In 2000, Larry became a founding director of the Center of Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. Larry has participated in more than 95 cruises, um, which is over 75 months at sea. I would have to go a lot more to sea to even come close. During the last 38 years, including nine mapping expeditions in the ice covered regions of the high Arctic. He is the recipient of the Keen Medal for Marine Geology geology and an honorary doctorate from the University of Stockholm in Sweden. He was a member of the President's Panel on Ocean Exploration and chaired National Academy of Science Studies on National Needs for Coastal Mapping and Charting at, and the Impact of the Deepwater Horizon Spill on Ecosystem Services um, in the Gulf of Mexico. He was the co-chair of the, of the NOAA's Ocean Exploration Advisory Working Group, the Vice Chair of the Consortium 
of Ocean Leadership's Board of Trustees and is currently the chair of the National Academy of Sciences Ocean Studies Board and the US Committee for the Decade of Ocean Science, a member of the State Department's Extended Continental Shelf Task Force, the Navy's SISEX um, Advisory Committee and Vice Chair of the Board of the Ocean Explore Exploration Trust. In 2016, Larry was appointed by President Obama to the Arctic Research Commission. In 2017, he was elected to the Hydrographic Society of America Hall of Fame. In 2018, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering and a year later, he was elected as a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Acad Academy of Science. And this year, Larry became the first recipient of the Walter Monk Medal from the Oceanography Society. And this medal is awarded for um, extraordinary accomplishments and novel insights in the area of physical oceanography, ocean acoustics, or marine geophysics. And Larry has been cited as being influential in defining the international efforts to map the world ocean, oceans by 2030. I would also like to stress, though, that um, in his citation, it was mentioned that Larry is known and appreciated for the outstanding mentoring of graduate students and postdocs um, during the course of his ex exemplary career. Sorry for the stuttering. Um, and without further ado, I would like to um, give the microphone to Larry on ocean mapping, the quest for a transparent ocean. Um, oh. One more thing, though, if you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer box, and then we'll um, answer them at the end of the session. Well, thank you very much, Gabby. Um, I'll have to shorten my talk a little. You do. <laughs> so I, I, it's embarrassing, but, but thank you. I, much appreciated. Um, I, I have to admit that when I was asked to give a talk uh, at IGPP, I was instantly uh, intimidated. Um, I was a graduate student, as Gabby mentioned, uh, at Scripps uh, in the 1970s, um, but uh, I was, uh, as we say, down the hill, in a, often in a derogatory sense, down at the main campus of Scripps, not up at IGPP, but I had lots of friends and colleagues up at IGPP, and I loved to come up the hill. I, I loved to walk up there. I loved uh, the architecture and... Uh, I show you this picture, which uh, was not quite the way it was in 1973 or four, but probably a lot closer to the way it was than the way it is now. Um, but I, I just loved coming up there. The, again, the architecture of the building was spectacular, the ambiance, the, the company of my friends and colleagues. But mostly what I really loved was uh, that view from the, uh, the conference room. And uh, that was just breathtaking. But sometimes I, I would come up there and it would be right after a class from, and I don't know how many you remember, Freeman Gilbert or George Backus. And the blackboards would be covered in equations and, and I'd stare at them and I'd say, what in the world did this all mean? I, it, it, and, and I felt quite uh, inadequate. So the idea of giving a, a lecture at IGPP is intimidating to me. But also by this uh, admission, I'm letting you know that I will not be giving a terribly quantitative talk as my career has been focused uh, more on exploration, experimentation, and, uh, and technology development. And really the belief that an interdisciplinary approach to uh, ocean science is critical for its success. And I, and I was set on this path uh, by my time at Scripps, really, uh, by having two advisors, as uh, Gabby mentioned, Wolf Berger, one of the world's uh, preeminent ocean, paleoceanographers, and uh, Fred Spies, a remarkable acoustician and uh, leader um, in um, the development of both the FLIP and the Scripps Deep Toe, which I, I got to work on as a graduate student. And these people came from very, very disparate fields. And we had, I don't know if it still goes on, but when I first came there, we had this kind of seminar in marine geology and geophysics that all the first year graduate students would sit to. And 
each week one of the faculty members came and just talked about what they did and it was kind of a, a recruiting uh, exercise to, to see who you wanted to go work for and I just was just enthralled with what Spies talked about but I was also enthralled with what Wolf Berger talked about and, and I just I sat and I tried to figure out a way to to combine these two totally different things the technology of looking at this in those days postage stamp sized pieces of the seafloor and studying global paleoceanography and I, and I figured out a way to do it, but it was a very dangerous path because I remember at that time folks would say, well, you know, when you defend your thesis, you should know more about your thesis topic than your thesis advisor. But by spreading myself so thin, there was no way in the world I knew more paleoceanography than Berger, and I certainly didn't know more acoustics than Spies. And I managed to slip through because I actually impressed Spies with how much paleoceanography I knew and impressed Burgo by how much acoustics I knew. So it managed, it managed to, to let me get through, but it also really made me appreciate that having this broad and interdisciplinary uh, uh, approach. And it set me on that path that, that I've really carried on most of my career, but it's also what made me so respect Walter Monk. Um, I had the privilege of uh, interacting with Walter as a, as a graduate student, but also all through my career at many, many different meetings and for over the years, including, I have to say, a, a task force oceanography uh, meeting that took place in San Diego two years ago today. It was Walter's 101st birthday. He participated in all three days of the conference and gave a very, very inspiring presentation. And just what, what, what a remarkable person. And it was always wonderful interacting with Walter. Um, of course, he, he was brilliant, uh, but also so generous with his time and his ideas. And uh, the thing that I most appreciated is that he didn't really care um, whether you were a biologist or a geologist or a physical oceanographer. He didn't care whether you were a modeler or experimentalist. He just wanted to understand the ocean. And uh, he recognized that we had to embrace all approaches and all disciplines to do that successfully. And I just found this so inspiring and encouraging. And, and that's why I'm, I'm just so honored to have been awarded the Monk Medal and why I'm honored to at least virtually be here today presenting the, the Monk Memorial Lecture. So I thank you so much for this invitation and, and the honor. And it, to me, it's just such a pleasure to, to do anything that, that, that honors Walter. As I pursued my career in this kind of interdisciplinary world, I looked at great jealousy uh, at many of my colleagues who also uh, were studying earth processes, at, at least uh, the, the green and the brown parts of the earth, who uh, through modern technology, through satellite imagery, um, could very, very easily establish what I like to call the, the geospatial context for the process that, processes that they were, they were studying. Uh, again, through, through the remarkable imagery techniques uh, we have, they could easily look at uh, dynamic uh, geomorphologic processes. They could look at cryosphere processes. They could look at um, quantitative digital terrain models. Um, and even remarkably could start characterizing the nature of the, of the surface of the earth in terms of this case, forest cover, even looking at the health, the health of the forest. It's, it's just remarkable what we can do um, with that kind of imagery. Initially, that wasn't so easy to do, but you know, we've gotten to a point now where literally any five-year-old can um, basically, with the push of a button, zoom in anywhere to the Earth, just go to Google Earth, and we can see anything with just tremendous accuracy and detail. Um, and derive so many, don't go sunbathing on the nude on the roof now, <laughs> um, and, and derive so much information about what's going on in, at many, many different levels of resolution. Well, as I said, this is true for that, the brown and the green and a couple of gray areas of the earth here, but that really is only about one quarter of the earth. What about the other three quarters of the earth, um, where if I applied the same technology, if I would zoom in, Basically, that's all I would see. And that's because of, of course, because the, the optical sensors, the electromagnetic waves that we use in the optical sensors just don't penetrate very far through the seawater. So we have this, this horribly um, opaque material kind of blocking those of us who are truly, really trying to understand that other three quarters of the earth that's hidden beneath the waters. 
and even those of us who want to understand what's going on in the water column. Well, we've developed technologies to, to penetrate that. Um, we can bring remotely operated vehicles. We can bring cameras and those kinds of optical sensors close to the seafloor, but we can't get around the physics that says we can't propagate electromagnetic waves very far. And so these instruments have a limited field of view. A uh, typical camera will be a couple of meters on the side in, in, in standard light with standard lighting conditions, and that's about it. And so if the question has been asked, and I've been asked it several times by Google, what would it take to do a, a Google Ocean at the scale of Google Earth? You can figure that out pretty easily. We know what the typical field of view of a camera is. We know what the area of the seafloor is. And this is now just worrying about the seafloor, not the, not the water column. But it'll take about that many images to image the seafloor. And if I do my count right, it's about 600 trillion images. And then the question is, how much time would it take to do that? And uh, now that's the other, there's a lot of ifs there. But if we just kind of roughly say the time it takes to get to the bottom, what we can move a vehicle like this, uh, how fast we can move a vehicle like this. And again, you can pick probably orders of magnitude different here, but the bottom line is it would take on the order of hundreds of millions of years to do it. And so the answer is we're not, and we can't cover the entire seafloor with centimeter scale imagery like we can do the land surface. And so we've had to look for other approaches. People have been trying to measure the depths of the oceans for years. You look at this uh, statue that came out of an Egyptian tomb from 2000 BC. You can see, and I see, can you see my cursor if I put it up there? Do you see that? Yeah, good. So there's the Egyptian ocean mapper up front there with his hunk of lead at the end of a rope, tossing it over, making what we call a lead line measure, seeing how long the rope is. Well, that's that, not so bad in shallow water. And I'll be having on the side here, the idea of the, in terms of data rates, what we get from a, a, an approach like that. And so you hear we're in the 0.01 megabytes per hour in terms of that lead line mapping. But if we see how the technology evolved, the next picture I was able to find is actually from 3,450 years later. It's a, a wood carving from the Thames River. And here are the, the English uh, ocean mappers. And what are they doing? They're doing exactly the same thing. A hunk of lead at the end of the rope to measure how deep it was. Well, if we jump 500 years ahead to the 1940s and take a look, what do we see? We see exactly the same thing. Here we have a, a team from what's what then called the Coast and Geo Geodetic Survey, the precursor of NOAA, using a lead at the end of a rope. And this can, I think, can be reasonably accurate in very shallow water. Once you get more than a few tens of meters deep, it gets a little less accurate. It's very time consuming and obviously very sparse. And so for those 4,000 years, though, that was the only way we had to measure the depth of the ocean. And it was as I said, very inaccurate, time consuming in deep water, remember Magellan. Magellan tried to do this in the Pacific and he had about 3000 meters of uh, cord with him and still wasn't able to reach the bottom. So he just said, it's unfathomable. I guess that's kind of a, a pun in there too. But between the first and second world war, um, echo sounders were developed um, with the recognition that while light doesn't travel very well in fluids or at least in seawater, um, sound travels very well. And so the echo sound, a very simple principle that if we, we send out an acoustic pulse and we know the speed at which uh, sound travels in seawater, which we can measure, um, if, we, if that sound, travel, if sound pulse travels along very nicely, it will keep going until it runs into something with a change in properties, what we call an impedance contrast, bounce back. We get the return and we divide by two and we have an idea of how deep it is, obviously much faster than a lead line, much more accurate than a lead line. And uh, if we look at the, the data density rate, you see we can really jump up several orders of magnitude now in terms of the amount of data we can collect in terms of depth measurements. This, these original echo sounders were called single beam echo sounders. Um, what they did is produce a wide cone of sound and then sonified a broad area of the seafloor, the, depending on the, the beam width of that echo sounder, that area of insonification is something between a quarter to maybe half of the water depth. So if we're in 4,000 meters of water, we've been sonifying all at once a piece of the seafloor that's about two kilometers in diameter. And if there's anything shallower, we get back one return 
And so we just get that first return back anywhere in that two kilometer area. We're gonna read that depth reading. That'll be the depth of that shallowest point, but we have no angular resolution. So we're gonna assume that it's directly under the ship. So this process of the single beam echo sound, again, a huge gain in terms of the rate and the accuracy at which we could collect the data, but it's a very blurry image. It's averaged over the kind of half the depth in terms of the footprint of the, of the sounders. And so we get this kind of blurry two-dimensional image of the seafloor. Um, but again, it was a huge step in the right direction. And if I think about my days of walking around the, the halls of, of Ritter Hall uh, at Scripps, I was actually in T, T5, one of the temporary buildings. It's gone now, but it was just across from, from Ritter Hall. Um, again, the temporary buildings that were built during the Second World War that I think there's still one up to a T29 still exists up, up, up top there. I think it's been renovated. I think that's the last one. But at that time, at that time, there were lots of uh, these uh, T buildings and, and the graduate students got to occupy them sometimes, faculty members too. But walking around the halls of the buildings were these wonderful series of maps. Uh, a fellow named Tom Chase would put them together. You see all the ship tracks coming out of Scripps each one with a single beam echo sounder. And then somebody like Tom would manually interpolate between those soundings. And now we can, of course, do that uh, digitally, connect the dots to create contours, to create what really well into the 1980s was the best image we had of what the seafloor topography off San Diego looked like. Um, this, this was kind of the best we could do. And the sparseness of the soundings, you can see how sparse they are, meant that there was a lot of interpolation there and the fact that the footprint of the sounder itself was blurry. It, it, this is really the, the best we could do. Well, coming towards the, the 80s again into the, into the 90s, there was an amazing development. And I don't know if Dave Sandwell is out in the crowd here, but Bill Haxby, uh, Dave and, uh, and Walter Smith uh, gave to us something that was just brilliant. And that was the the derivation of bathymetry from satellite altimetry, the understanding that the surface of the ocean um, will respond to the gravitational attraction of uh, the excess mass when we have a seamount or the, or the absence of mass when we have a deep trench, and that will result in deviations in the ocean surface. And if we have an accurate satellite altimetry, they can track that. And so there's been this spectacular step forward in terms of a really global picture of the large scale features of the seafloor. And, and suddenly we have a global map of the ocean. I'll, I'll actually say that it does this, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, somewhat a disservice for those of us who are trying to map at higher resolution because uh, I, I remember uh, going into a congressman office and he was the head of the uh, Ocean Caucus, a group of congressmen who just you know, really pushed for ocean issues. And I was there with Admiral Gaffney and uh, we were trying to um, talk them into a project that would map the whole world ocean. And um, he had this map, a satellite drive altimetry, uh, bathymetry map uh, in his office. And he looked and he said, why do we need to map the ocean? Don't we have it all mapped? And at this scale, we have a, a pretty remarkable map, but I'll, I'll hopefully make the argument that we need to map it at a, a little higher resolution if we're going to really understand lots of ocean processes. Um, and I've tried, I tried to explain that in, in, in several different ways, but I, I, I'll use an example here that I, I, I showed in Monaco to the Prince of Monaco, who's a great supporter of, of oceanography and ocean processes. And we take a look at a, a satellite image of Monaco and Monaco Harbor. Um, and again, with its unbelievable resolution, and I, I pulled out a digital train model, a 3D elevation model, and we can do higher resolution than this now. But at that time, about 30 meter resolution was what we had with a with the easily accessible digital train model. And you can cl clearly see Monaco Harbor, and Monaco is still there. But then I said, but if I would look at the same image with the resolution of the satellite altimetry, I had to apologize to him that Monaco would be gone, it just disappears. Um, and so the, that satellite imagery is phenomenal. Satellite uh, derived bathymetry, excuse me, is phenomenal at, at a ocean scale and, and at a tectonic process scale. It really gives us phenomenal insight into it. Um, but at a scale of really understanding a whole other range of ocean pro processes, it really is not adequate. If we again look at the look at the entire ocean, it's fantastic. If we zoom into a 200 by 200 kilometer piece of seafloor, 
it looks something like that. And so we need to push further in terms of really looking at the geospatial context at a scale that, that is appropriate. And we were fortunate that coming out of the military in the early 80s uh, was a, a new type of mapping system called a multi-beam sonar. And what the multi-beam sonar does is uh, uses instead of just a, a single transducer or a group of transducers to put out one single beam, it uses a long array that's in the a long ship direction, a long skinny array. That long array in the long ship direction uh, transmits and it produces a fan-shaped beam that insonifies the seafloor. Here's the beam, what's on the seafloor, and that can go out to oh, three to five, even seven times the water depth in terms of what it covers. So that's insonified all at once, all that, that yellow area insonified. And you're looking at the, for those acousticians out there, the 3 dB down points for the, trans, the transmitted pulse here. You can see it here. And then along with that transmitter, transmitter is an orthogonal array in a pattern we call a Mills T or a Mills cross. And that's the receiver, the, the orthogonal one. And what the receiver does is it beam forms and it forms sometimes hundreds of individual beams. You can see them each year um, across the swath. And what we do is we basically uh, take a look at the, the product of the two, the cross product. And we end up basically just getting returns from those areas where the beams intersect. Um, and so we can have hundreds literally of very accurate sounding measurements across a wide swath. And this has just radically changed the way we look at the seafloor. Um, we've gone from our single beam sonar, which is this blurry average of something like half the water depth, to now hundreds of individual little depth measurements uh, over a wide swath that are resolved individually. If we look at my little curves here of tracking the, the rate of uh, data in terms of megabytes per hour, as we've gone from the lead lines to the single beam to now a series of multi beams and these multi beams will collect higher and higher rate data as the water gets shallower and shallower so in deep water it'll take many seconds for the sound to go down and, and then come back and we wait for the next one before we ping again but in shallow water you can do this really really rapidly because it doesn't have to go very far in shallow water so the data rates in shallow water are very uh, high um, so we see here that we've now gone from, with uh, some of our deep water systems, a megabyte, a, a megabyte an hour of data, to with some of our sh uh, shallow water uh, systems, we can we can collect on the order of a gigabyte of data an hour. And this change has just absolutely revolutionized what we see. It. If we go take a look at again our 200 by 200 kilometer piece of seafloor, and this is a piece of seafloor of Hawaii. This is the the satellite uh, altimetry, the predicted bathymetry from satellite altimetry underneath, and run a single swath of a multi-beam through it, we see just this remarkable difference. And I say, what a difference a swath makes in terms of now we're seeing features at a scale where we really can start looking at geologic processes, local geologic processes, and a whole range of other things. So this is what just has so revolutionized uh, our way to look at the seafloor. Um, if we go back to our map off Southern California, a colleague of mine, Jim Gardner, and I uh, spent a few months when the multi-beam sonars became available out there. He was uh, working for the USGS in charge of their Pacific mapping. And basically, we're able to turn that map into this map. And again, as it says here, you know, this amazing perspective we just could not get from the sparse measurements. Now we have complete overlapping coverage with individual depth measurements and millions and millions of depth measurements. And we can really start looking at canyon processes, slumping processes, all kinds of things that, that we just couldn't see before. And so this was just, it was just a revolution in terms of our ability to see, uh, to uh, our ability to see processes. Uh, th and this came along at the same time with concomitant advances in computer power, because we needed the computer power to handle it, and the development of visualization techniques to really take advantage of this tremendous data density. And I have to say navigation capabilities with uh, differential GPS and beyond kinematic GPS that allows us to position the ship very uh, carefully and uh, developments in motion sensors because we have to compensate very carefully for the motion of the ship. So all these things came together to, to, to allow us to be able to, to suddenly start seeing the ocean in this way, the seafloor at least in this way. Um, it turns out that's not all that we were able to collect though with these systems. 
uh, the, the sonar goes out, comes back, we're measuring the travel time. So this is a kind of, we call it a time of flight measurement. But at the same time, we also can look at the amplitude of the return and something we call backscatter. And so here, if we look at this survey off uh, Hawaii, this is now the depth surface, the time of flight surface. Uh, uh, this is Honolulu in here. This is the land, of course. Um, and this is going down for going from about 40 meters depth down to about uh, five, six, maybe 700 meters depth in the deeper parts here. Um, so we can see clearly where the bottom is, but with this backscatter you now produced in a, a grayscale, which uh, in this case, uh, white colors are going to be high backscatter, light colors and, and uh, darker gray is low backscatter. I'm going to drape the backscatter on top of it. It gives us a whole new dimension in terms of uh, what we're seeing, some indication of the nature of the seafloor. So it's not just where the seafloor is, now we're starting to look at what the seafloor is. Um, and it's a, not a one-to-one -one matching of sediment type or, or rock type, it's a, a complicated uh, um, product of, of the roughness of the seafloor and the hardness of the seafloor, but it does give us some insight. Um, in this case, we were out here surveying because uh, for years, uh, the Navy had been dumping dredge deposits out off Hawaii here, and uh, they were wondering what they looked like. You know, could you see them? And you cannot see any indication in the bathymetry of those dredge site deposits. But if I put the backscatter on, they go out with a, a barge, they open up the doors of a barge, and they drop this deposit, and they typically have these circular deposits. And you now can see each individual deposit. They have another type of uh, a barge that has a conveyor belt. You can see, and this is at five, 600 meters of water, you can see where the conveyor belts were running along. Most interestingly, you can see bed forms here. This is not a, an artifact of, of a problem with the data. These ripples here are very large bed forms indicating a fast current. And you can see in the area where there's a fast current, the dredge spoils have been smeared out. And so they're covering the whole area. So it adds this entire new dimension of what the seafloor is too. And this is very important from looking at habitat and other types of other types of issues. You can see also the, the rock outcrops, the volcanic outcrops here, you can see even more bright, um, uh, so higher backscatter. Now this is in a very qualitative sense. Uh, also, uh, we've evolved in terms of qualitative backscatter uh, that um, here in a color map, as opposed to a grayscale, starting to be a great indicator of uh, local seep communities, deposits and things like that will show up as higher bright uh, deposits. Um, oil companies are using this as a prospecting tool sometimes uh, because these are associated with seeps and I'll go to the seeps in a minute. But uh, again, we're, we're getting closer and closer. This is still in a qualitative sense to try to go from more than where the bottom is to what the bottom is. So we've been trying to push this and go into a more quantitative sense. We're very fortunate that there's some very smart folks around who are building theories about how sound interacts with the bottom. Uh, the group of the University of Washington in particular, uh, Daryl Jackson and his colleagues have starting back in 86, but evolving and evolving and working, still working on it now, have uh, developed some, some very nice models for how we would expect sound to interact with the seafloor as a function of its angle of incidence. And so we have a, a theory of what that should look like. We now go into our backscatter data. We've developed a tool that lets us do what we call an angular response analysis. Um, we get starting at the, what we call the nadir, the center of the sonar, looking out across a half a swath in this case. We get the red curve as a real data set. As you go further and further out in the angle, it predicts that the backscatter uh, should get lower and lower. Um, and it really depends on a whole bunch of parameters uh, in, uh, in the sediment type. And we try to do an inversion then uh, based on some tables and we simplify it. For those of you who live in the, in the seismic world, we use the old uh, AVO technique, uh, amplitude versus offset. So we, we have these characteristics of the curve shape that we try to fit. Um, we look up, we have a big lookup table. And at the end of the day, we do this inversion, but we have constrained the inversion. I, I, I'm not really a modeler um, and, and I'm not doing the modeling work here. Of course, that comes from, from uh, Jackson and, and those guys, but I've also hang, hung out enough with modelers that I know modelers, if they're unconstrained, can come up with some really, really strange results sometimes. And so 
we were fortunate, and this is another Scripps in San Diego story. Also on my thesis committee was a fellow named Ed Hamilton, who worked for back, that, back then NEL, who was the, the Navy lab out in Point Loma. Uh, it's changed its name so many times now, I can't keep track of what it's called now. But he was a remarkable fellow, and he was the Navy's measure of the physical properties of sediments. And he, in his lab, and I worked there one summer, would just constantly measure the sound speed and the density and the, and the, and the uh, porosity and, and just property after property of the sediments. And published many papers uh, in the public domain, had much data that was kept, kept on, uh, on the non-public domain, uh, but ended up with a whole bunch of physical property relationships that would say, if the grain size is such, this is how you could predict the sound speed and so on. And so what we did in this approach is try to constrain that, um, that uh, inversion so that it would never violate any of the relationships that, uh, that Ed Hamilton found. And at the end of the day, it comes up with a, I'm gonna call it a, a guess, because that's really all it is, a wild ass guess of what the sediment type may be based on, on that inversion process and, and Hamilton's tables. But it's a step. I mean, we're tar starting to make steps to trying to be much more quantitative about really extracting the properties of the seafloor from the acoustic backscatter. So this is as a function of its angular response. There's another free parameter there, and that's the frequency. And now we're starting to see multi-beam sonars at many, many different frequencies. Um, and so once we have that, we can now look at the same piece of seafloor with different frequencies and start looking at the frequency response and see if that will tell us something about its characteristics. And that is a, a useful information, a little more difficult, but we've just had recently a, a graduate student here on the supervision, one of my colleagues, John Hughes Clark, who has really done an exciting experiment where they're looking, stepping in and using not a multi-beam sonar, but using these fishery sonars, really, scientific sonars, that, which are split beam sonars, um, but they're all calibrated. That's the key. These sonars are calibrated. It's very difficult to calibrate a, a uh, multi-beam sonar, but the single beam sonars can be calibrated. And uh, using these on a, with many frequencies and a, a, ang a table that's, whose angle can change to try to start to put together um, an image of what the CIFRA looks like at all angles, and at a range of frequencies. And once we start doing that, we'll really truly start understanding the, the frequency response of the seafloor. We now have to get that same level of calibration to our multi-beam sonar. So that's kind of where we are in the seafloor characterization world. But our sonars also, over the last few years, and really it's only in the last eight or nine years, have also started to allow us to look at more than just the seafloor. We can now start looking at the water column. And this was first, developed uh, really uh, you know, as a means of looking at fish schools and, and revise all, in a qualitative sense, all kinds of interesting uh, um, indications of the dynamics of schooling behavior. Now, you know, instead of fish, there have been many fishery sonars for years, but they're, they're very narrow beam, those little sonars I showed you in the last picture. But now we can look over you know, seven times the water depth and start seeing the behavior of fish schools. And, and again, we're trying to push this in a more quantitative way, but just after we installed the very first of these water column capable deep water sonars on a NOAA research vessel, Okeanos Explorer, uh, we were going out on the field trials, steaming into port after its first field trials. And as we steamed uh, back uh, to San Francisco, all of a sudden, what do we see in the water column imagery, but this amazing uh, high backscattered target coming up, looking like a jet or a plume. And that's what it was. We quickly started developing ways to extract the backscatter. And this was a natural gas seep. And we shouldn't have been surprised. It was in an area that is known for that. We shouldn't have been surprised that the sonar would pick it up so well. A gas bubble is a phenomenal resonator of acoustic energy. But boy, it just opened up our eyes to, to what a tool we had. We had to get into port. So we uh, hurried back out as soon as we could the next day to see if this, or not the next week, I should say, to see if this was an ephemeral target or not. Uh, it wasn't, it was still there. And then we went and found a whole bunch of others all along the fault chain. So again, nothing surprising, just it was just how sensitive this was uh, to these gas seeps. It's really, I think, opened our eyes to the tools we had. And so we started again, developing tools to visualize this and, and um, hone in on them. And this happened uh, literally a, a month or two before Deepwater Horizon, the Deepwater Horizon spill. 
And so when Deepwater Horizon spill uh, happened, we were called down and asked if we can use our acoustic systems to try to map the deep plume of uh, oil and gas. Um, to be honest, we did not have uh, multi-beam sonar that we could use to that for that. So we went back to the fishery sonars, which have some advantage, except that they look straight down. So we couldn't stand off the side and all the, all the focus was on capping the well. So there was a huge crowd of vessels there capping the well, and we really weren't allowed over the, the Deepwater Horizon leak until, and here's another nice scripts and IGBP connection, Marsha McNutt, who was the director of the USGS at the time, um, uh, was very involved with the Secretary of Energy in terms of a task force, and I would sit in on those uh, meetings uh, relating our efforts there. And uh, when they thought they really had finally figured out how to cap the well, and let me show you uh, what, what this looked like. This is when we finally got in over the uh, wellhead. What happened was the, they were concerned that there would be a breakout on the side and then they would have an uncontrollable leak, uh, more so than the one they uh, uh, were trying to control. And um, I remember the Secretary of Energy asked me, he said, if we, cap this well, and it starts to leak on the side, we'd have a, a few hours to, to try to uncap it and things like that before really bad things would happen. Can you guarantee that uh, you'll see gas leaking? And that, you know, the scientists in the word guarantee don't, don't go to what, at least in my mind, don't, maybe you guys, you can guarantee. I, I, I don't like the guarantee, but, um, you know, I talked to all my acquisition colleagues, you know, gas is just such a good target. We said, yeah, if it, we, we think we could see it. And so you can see in these pictures here, th this is how we had to wind our way through all these other vessels out there tending the well, came over it after the cap. And sure enough, we saw this plume of gas and we said, no, nope, there's something happening there. They sent down some ROVs and that's all it was. It was just a few gas bubbles per second in terms of a leak. But that's how sensitive the acoustics are. Uh, and so they monitored this. It was, it was decided this was not a dangerous leak at all. This, uh, and they monitored it the entire time until the, the well was cemented in. But again, just how powerful the acoustics are for seeing these kinds of processes in the water column. Uh, and this has led now to uh, quite a bit of use of these kinds of tools um, for mapping now seeps, natural seeps, and, and sometimes uh, unnatural ones or man-made leaks. But for the most part, they, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of natural seeps uh, throughout the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere in the world. And so folks are, are again, uh, really focusing on using multi-beam sonar as a tool to, to map and locate the seeps. Again, in a qualitative sense, so we're trying to, again, push this uh, a little more uh, quantitatively, and we fall back upon those single-beam sonars, again, which can be calibrated, like have an absolute calibration in terms of backscatter strength, and so we have a, a, a wonderful graduate student who's been working on uh, the uh, project here where we're able to actually track individual bubbles from a seep. Each one of those little blue dots is an individual bubble. This is an automatic detection algorithm for them. If we can look with a calibrated sonar at the target strength of those bubbles, the theory is, is well enough established that based on target strength, we can determine the size of the bubble you see here target strength versus size. And in this case, it's a three millimeter bubble. We can see the rise rate. So we know the rise rate. We know the size of the bubble. We can calculate the flux of gas coming out. And equivalent stuff done by Tom Weber, a colleague of mine, uh, can be done for oil. So again, we're trying to push this into a more uh, quantitative sense. Coming back to the multi-beams in areas where there are real strong contrasts, usually shallow water estuarine environments, we can now start seeing all kinds of intriguing physical ocean uh, oceanographic phenomena. Kelvin Helmholtz waves up here, an internal wave breaking down here. Um, and that, again, didn't surprise us. It's wonderful to see it. We, when you see a big, strong impedance contrast like that between the two water masses, you're not that surprised. But what really did surprise us is what, during uh, one of our trips to the Arctic, um, where we've been doing tons of mapping for the law of the sea issues that I'm not gonna talk about now. This was actually a, a trip on the icebreaker Odin. Again, doing a 12 kilohertz multi-beam survey, the seafloor and the red down here, lots of fish were, were stopped here for a CTD station. You can actually see on the multi-beam, the CTD going down and then coming up. These horizontal lines are unfortunately a noise source on the Odin. It's a steam hammer, it's, we're in the Arctic, it's very cold. They have to heat the oil 
the fuel. And so it's a steam system that unfortunately makes some acoustic noise. But you know, this is our classic, uh, we're mapping the bottom. In this case, we're, we're drifting uh, as we do the CTD. And we typically would always see this noise up near the surface and not paying much attention to it. But I noticed this, this, this line here just looked so consistent. It just didn't look like a normal noise. And when we looked at the CTD, what did we see that, hmm, look, at there's a, an amazing change in the temperature and salinity. And it seems to correspond to these, what we thought were just noise up in the, in the top of the water column. And so what do we do? We broke out the old, not the old, the new wideband, broadband fisheries echo sounder again, the one with narrow beam, but broadband give us much higher resolution. And when we looked at this structure with that, what did we see? Literally hundreds of tiny little layers. This is a zoom of, of one little area here. These are a few meters apart tiny steps um, that in the CTD record are showing up perfectly as temperature salinity steps. And we're seeing each one of them as an acoustic layer. What we're seeing are what are called the uh, thermohaline stair steps. That's something that's not uncommon in areas like the Arctic or other areas where you actually have an inversion of uh, cold, fresh water sitting on top of warm, more saline water. Um, and so you have a density inversion and the density and the salinity diffuse out at different rates. It's a double diffusion process that causes, causes these amazing stair steps. But the thing that we were shocked at is we can see each one of them acoustically. So now we have a tool to map this process, which is very tied into distribution of heat um, in the Arctic. And so this just really, really surprised us, made us very happy. Uh, we also saw the process break down and we see a much more turbulent structure in the water column again the CTD profile here. And in areas where they don't develop, we were able to see over hundreds of kilometers actually trace the mixed layer, the thermocline, on and on and on and on, and also see this breakdown too. And here, we don't know what we're seeing here, but we think it's actually an internal wave that's broken now in training air bubbles as it, as it intersects with the surface. I'd, lo I'd love to get input from, from other folks here to, 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 know what, to know what this might be. Um, Liz, Liz our, Widener, our, our graduate student, is now um, looking at something very exciting in the Baltic using the same approach. And here in the Baltic now, she's been able to trace basically a horizon that corresponds to the oxygen minimum. And so now acoustically, we can trace over literally tens of kilometers and, and more the level of the oxygen minimum in the Baltic. So I think we're, 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 we're really gaining, we're making these steps to try to make everything a little more quantitative and really understand uh, better what we can see in terms of trying to turn the ocean a bit more transparent. Where are we going? Well, bandwidth is information. And so hopefully we're gonna start seeing broader band multi-beams. Right now we have to bring multiple different multi-beams together to get the frequency bandwidth we want. To, to look over different bands, but if we can build a, and that's a manufacturer's challenge, build a, build a broadband chirp multi-beam, that would be wonderful. We have to start calibrating the multi-beam so we can do the same things we're doing with the fishery sonars with the multi-beam. We're gonna be seeing all kinds of pressure for more density, uh, more solutions for, for depth and backscatter across the footprint. Um, but we may also start seeing new multi-beam geometries. Why, have, why do you have to have a fan? Why not an annulus that just repeats itself? So we really can automatically see the seafloor at different angles. Um, and folks are working on that. We'll see lots of, you know, with, with, with new electronic software defined sonars, better integration of the sound speed profile, better estimates on certainty. We're gonna start pushing lots of instrumentation um, down onto the sonar itself and automatic processing tools. I'll talk at the very end about synthetic aperture sparse arrays. And uh, what we're seeing pressured from everywhere is this pressure for autonomous uh, delivery systems. And so our lab is uh, pushing very hard. We have a, a little fleet of autonomous vessels, some of them large, a four meter vessel here, diesel powered vessel, some little kind of small ones that are, that are very useful, but, but little battery powered things and, and a, a new very high speed uh, vessel, wave piercing vessel. This is about seven meters long. That's really been designed uh, for uh, hydrographic operations. Um, we first looked at these just as, as tools to uh, get into places that were too dangerous for manned vessels to get to, you know, a close, close quarter surveying, I call it. 
uh, so we can put it right up against uh, the shoreline um, and, and actually in this case looking into sea caves and things like that so so really quite powerful uh, way to do that but with the high speed vessels now we can really start thinking them thinking about them as a force multiplier we've gone through tests with this vehicle here we're at 12 knots we're seeing no degradation in data and so we're, we're working very closely with NOAA and others um, to really see how we make these a force multiplier and so that you can launch a series of these around the mothership and really start maximizing the amount of data that's collected. And so I hope that I've convinced you that we, we've come a long way. This initial map here is uh, one that uh, uh, Fontaine Murray collected uh, 80 soundings in the Atlantic and then it's zoomed in or it's let me go back to see the 80 soundings which he tried to define the bathymetry of the Atlantic using a, a cannonball at the end of a, a long wire. Um, coming into the, the remarkable change that we get from the, the satellite altimetry derived bathymetry, it really is remarkable. Um, but how much of the ocean now is covered with this multi-beam sonar data that I've been talking about? And so if we look at the national, well, I think they're, yeah, National Center for Environmental Information, they're called now, used to be NGDC, and look at their compilation of, of the best they have in terms of global multi-beam data. It doesn't look all that bad when I look at it at this scale. Look at these areas here, look like they're you know, almost completely covered. That's fantastic. But if we zoom in to that area, what we see is it's not at all covered. It, you know, it's just the fact that I'm trying to fit the whole world and I can't make the swath so small. And so even at this scale here, it doesn't show you how little is covered. Um, the bottom line is that um, as of today, we have about 19%. We have data available. There, there's probably a lot more map than that, but uh, available to the public right now is 19% of the global ocean covered uh, with multi-beam sonar data. So it leaves about 81% um, uncovered. Um, we've uh, built another tool just to try to hone in on this fact that how little is covered. And it's a tool that basically lets you pick any uh, area, 1800 by uh, 1800 kilometers by 1100 kilometers, and you zoom in and you see the existing data here and you see it at true scale. So this swath here coverage is truly the percentage of this 1800 kilometer area that's covered and everything that's gray has never had a sounding. The little tiny white dots are single beam soundings and that's it. So for this area here, 1800 by 1100 uh, kilometers, probably 85% of that has never seen sound in terms of coverage. Uh, and this is the area where the MH370, the Malaysian airline uh, crashed. And when they went in to try to uh, send autonomous underwater vehicles to look for that, um, uh, uh, for the wreckage, they found out that sometimes the, the estimates of depth were off by as much as a thousand meters. So these are the reasons why we need to try to really start filling in the gaps. Well, what would it cost to do that? To, and I'm only gonna look at water depths greater than 200 meters because that swath gets narrower in shallow water. So the 200 meters and less will take forever to do, but we'll leave that to, to national entities and hydrographic agencies. But if we look at the, the ocean deeper than 200 meters and we just look at current technology, um, and we'll look at a range of a system that will do four times uh, swath width um, and go 10 knots or three and a half times at seven and a half knots, kind of two end members. It would take us about 70,000 days at this rate, 127,000 days. If you look at the cost of a standard research vessel, about $45,000 a day. So it would cost us between about three and $5 billion to map the global ocean deeper than 200 meters. And you say, who, who's going to do that? Who's going to spend $3 billion to $5 billion to, to map the oceans? Well, you know, we do that already, but on other planets. Every one of the Mars missions costs about $3 billion, and we've got Mars mapped completely to 20-meter resolution, a lot of it to 1-meter res resolution, and it costs $3 billion. And we get feet and meters mixed up sometimes, and we send another mission up there and do it again. And that's wonderful. I love the fact that we do that. And we should do that. But don't we owe it to our own planet to, to maybe start there? So let's take one of those missions and, and turn it inward. I'm going the wrong way. That's what got me confused. For Earth, 
as I said, for 81% of it, that's the resolution we have. But we have the technology I showed you with surface ship multi-beam to, to map it, oh, depending on water depth from, from tens of meters to maybe 100, 200 meter resolution, the whole world ocean. I showed you what it would cost to do it. If we really wanted to get precise, we can send down autonomous underwater vehicles and get close. It would take us a lot longer, it would cost a lot more, but we can get meter resolution or centimeter resolution if we get really close with a high resolution sonar. And we're seeing a lot of efforts. Uh, Gabby mentioned the Seabed 2030 um, project, which is uh, funded by the Nippon Foundation and JEPCO to map the entire world ocean by 2030. They're not paying for the mapping, they're paying for the facilitation of the mapping. So global centers to accumulate data, we've gone from 6% to 15 to 19% just by finding new data that is available, finding data that existed to, to make it publicly available. And we're still working on that. But the bottom line is we'll never get this done with existing technology um, in that time frame. We have to look at new technology. And if we look at say the distribution of costs for a typical oceanographic research vessel, we see that crew costs a lot, fuel costs a lot. So if we think to the future and we think about something like an autonomous barge, think about the geometry. I can put a 30 meter long sonar on there and get 17 meter resolution and 4,000 meters of water. Think of all the different other oceanographic measurements you can make from a, an autonomous barge like that. I get rid of the crew costs, I can cut the cost down 30%. They can spend a lot more time, probably reduce a lot of the other expenses, certainly consumables would be reduced. And so that's one way that I can reduce this cost. If I wanted to get rid of the fuel, maybe I can look at a sail derived, a sail powered mapping vessel. Well, there are sail drones around. They're remarkable vessels that have missions up to nine, 12 months, but they're small. These are seven meters long or so, and we're not gonna fit a deep water mapping um, sonar on it. But if you can have a sail powered vessel, and then I'd remove the crew cost, the fuel cost, the consumables, shore support would probably go up a little, maintenance, but these can go out for, you know, again, six, nine months at a time and constantly map, 24 hours a day mapping. Well, what if we built a big one like 22 meters, large enough that we can put a deep water mapping system on it. And I'm happy to say that there is one. It's not a dream anymore. Uh, the sail drone surveyor is uh, being constructed as we speak up near San Francisco. And uh, just to give you an idea of the size of it, there's a, I can put a deep water, what we call an EM-304, 30 gigahertz deep water mapping sonar system on there. And this hopefully will be launched um, first week or so of November. And uh, we're very, very excited about this. All of these things I've talked about though are really just changing the platform, the efficiency, lowering the cost. There is one thing going on now, and this is going on mostly at Lincoln Labs and we're collaborating a little with them, but I'm, I'm really excited about this. And, and this is really the first quantum leap I've seen in the approach to seafloor mapping. And that's this idea of a sparse array. And so the idea is that you, uh, you have a number of small little autonomous vessels. A few of them are sources, many receivers. And in theory, and I, I emphasize the in theory, we should be able to get one meter target resolution of 4,000 meters of water. But a lot of this depends on our ability to understand what's going on in the water column. And it really becomes a massive tomographic experiment. And uh, this is where I wish, wish Walter were around still, because I would just love to chat with him about this. And I think he would very, very quickly point out all the flaws in the approach, but just as quickly come up with all kinds of clever suggestions for how to resolve them. But most importantly, he would constantly be encouraging. And if his eyes twinkled as they sometimes did, then I knew we would have a good idea here and it would really keep us going and encourage us to finish it. 
So let me end there. And I'm going to end with a very traditional um, oceanographic ending. They typically show a sunset, but this is uh, from the Arctic. And so it's not just a sunset. It's actually a sunset and a sunrise. That was it. You know, the sun popped up, but kept, went, went, went back down. And I think it's very fitting for, for this whole concept of, of ocean mapping or really trying to make the, the ocean more transparent because I don't think at all, we're nowhere near the end of this. We're really just at the, at the beginning. So again, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight. I wish I could be there with you. I think somewhere, but certainly I'd love to be in that conference room at IGPP <laughs> and looking out at the beautiful sunsets I used to see there. So thank you. Feel free to clap uh, <laughs> virtually, I guess. Um, so the floor, thank you for an excellent talk. Well, thank um, you. We, we open the floor for questions and answers. So the first one is by John Olson. Uh, what is the ultimate fate of the methane released on a seafloor? Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. Um, because I was very concerned when we started to see all these seeps that, you know, this is just not being, uh, not being uh, accounted for in the climate models. But it turns out that uh, the ocean is, is terribly undersaturated with respect to, to methane. So much of it goes into, it goes back into solution. Um, it, it, th those seeps should not really uh, extend as far as they do up but there is a coating of uh, gas hydrate typically um, uh, that was actually a little frozen. The bubbles are actually frozen. And so that will protect them. And so they'll, they'll come up until that eventually dissolves and then they'll go in solution. They will, it will enter the atmosphere um, though, if the flux is high enough or the water is shallow enough. And, and there, are, there are examples of both those happening. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to get a better idea of the flux of gas. And the one thing I wonder, and, and, um, I, and I, you know, I'm not a geochemist at all, is I would think that as the methane enters into the water to come, it, it has to affect the, uh, the pH, the overall pH of, of, the, uh, of the ocean too. So there must be some, some effect there, but I, I leave that to a geochemist to, to talk about that. So in, in relation to this, you used to, I have a question actually. So you used to fish find us to do this, right? So is yeah. there anything specific you have to do with a, EK80 or anything other than to find fish that you actually find these um, seeps? Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, I, I, think, I think my fisheries colleagues will be <laughs> very insulted to call it a fish finder. Th these, are, these are fisheries sonars. These are very sophisticated fisheries <laughs> sonars. A and so um, I think just to find them, nothing special has to be done to, to do the kind of flux measurement we're talking about they have to be calibrated. The fisheries people calibrate them all the time. It's a very uh, cumbersome process. You take a tungsten uh, sphere, a tiny little sphere that has a known acoustic backscatter, very carefully machined, and it has to be hung below the ship and then maneuvered into the center of the beam and moved around the beam. It, it can take many, many hours to do that. Giant fishing rods on the, on the ship to, to maneuver this, this little sphere. Um, uh, underneath it. So to, to get the flux, uh, they, they, you have to calibrate it and the fisheries people do all the time because that's how they do their quantitative biomass estimates uh, by calibrating against the, the target strength of the sphere, they can calibrate the target strength of the uh, fish. Um, so there's that part of it. Um, to get the kind of uh, po to position of the seep takes uh, some much more careful processing in terms of refraction corrections and some, there, there's usually a blind spot at the bottom of the fishery sonar, so extrapolation down to, to try to find the source. But we've been reasonably successful with that in, in terms of being able to then send a, a remotely operated vehicle. We see a seep acoustically and able to direct a remotely operated vehicle. It's very hard for the vehicles to see the bubbles. The, the lighting, you, you really kind of want a backlight and things like that to see the bubbles. You can, you can get it close. And so... We're now using a sonar, actually, another sonar on the remotely operated vehicle to really zero in on the seep and then to pick, then to pick it up optically. Mm -hmm. The next question is by Karen Wishner. Um, oh, another, one of my classmates <laughs> from Scripps. With regard to the OMC interface slide you showed, uh, do you think you are seeing just a density gradient or a layer of particles or zooplankton at the OMC interface? 
Yeah. Okay. That's a great question because um, you know, I think we know because we've had, they were, there was all kinds of CTD work. There was bottle work and stuff like that. And um, uh, it really is. And, and, and I, I didn't go into the detail here. It really is the dense it's in this case, in, in that one, in the, it's a salinity, it's a salinity gradient that we're seeing um, which, which makes perfect sense. It's a halocline. And it turns out that the oxygen minimum zone just happens to correspond beautifully where the reflection coefficient manifests itself, manifests itself on the acoustic record. But for all these thin layers, we always wondered, are they particles really? Are they zooplankton or things like that? And uh, we can demonstrate that the reflection coefficient just from the density and sound speed change um, is enough to explain the target, that we don't need to have particles in there, um, for at least the ones we're seeing. Many, many of them are particles, and there's no question there. And there are layers in the, uh, in the Baltic that are very particle rich um, layers too, and they'll come up as reflections too. But, uh, but so far, the ones that I've shown here, we, we're pretty convinced uh, don't need particles. I should, let me put it that way. You don't need particles to generate that um, reflection coefficient or impedance contrast. The next comment is by John Orcutt. Uh, one thing that Malta wanted to try was in sonifying the volume under an ice shelf to determine temperature as well as morphology of the ice and seafloor. Um, seems practical now. So that's your question. Does it seem practical? Well, the, the, there has been now work uh, certainly under the ice that's looked up upward. AUVs have gone with sonars looking upward. Um, Peter Wadhams has done some of this at the topography of the ice. Um, looking at the thermal structure, um, I think it's potentially, I think, you know, I, I would love to start doing this kind of stuff that I'm showing you now from a vehicle below the ice looking upward and, and looking at the structure and looking at salt interfaces and things like that, salt fingers, uh, stuff like that. I think it is, it probably is feasible. Uh, yes, John. Now, John was another classmate, but he, he was a classmate who finished in just a few years when the rest of us still graduate students. And the next thing we know, he was assistant director IGPP and we're all, we're all postdocs. <laughs> next question is by Sophia Orle. Uh, you talked about collaborating with other countries, um, for example, Prince of Mon oh, Morocco or Monaco. Monaco. It yeah. says Morocco here. Do you incorporate a lot of these social aspects in your research are these other countries um, actively participating in or funding this kind of research? Like, is this a global scale multi-nation project? Have you run into barriers uh, with this aspect of your research? Okay, another great question. Um, so, so, I mean, almost everything we do, the, the, the work uh, in the Arctic was certainly multinational um, and that was, we were on a Swedish icebreaker but I, but I think uh, Sophia's question is, is probably broader. And I think the most relevant uh, project there is the uh, Seabed 2030, which is a, a hugely international project. It's not an American project at all. It's, uh, I said, funded by the Nippon Foundation in Japan. Uh, there are four regional offices, uh, one in New Zealand, one in Germany, um, one in uh, New York, and one shared between Sweden and um, Sweden and our lab in uh, in uh, wherever I am, New Hampshire. I think I couldn't remember where I was for a minute. Um, and it has a, a, a global office that sits in uh, the UK. So that really is a is a is a global effort, and it has to incorporate cooper, uh, cooperation from as many countries as we can because. One of the things we need to do, um, and I'll say sadly, is often ask countries permission to map in their waters. Uh, and so there's lots of efforts now trying to do that uh, through the Inter International Hydrographic Organization. Um, uh, so so the, certainly the spirit that there is really one of international cooperation. It's closely tied in with the UN decade of ocean science uh, and support of, or for sustainable development. Um, they've called upon, they've called as one of the the, the challenges, a uh, complete mapping of the ocean too. And so I think this really is something that has uh, risen to the level of truly uh, international recognition. Mm -hmm, thank you. Um, Ignacio Sepulveda, one of our postdocs um, asks, great talk by the way, what do you think um, 
it is an what do you think is an acceptable resolution we should aim to capture when mapping the bathymetry of the entire ocean? Yeah, so that's a great question, Ignatius, and thank you for your, for your comment. Um, I, my answer is always that as high as we can, but but there are trade-offs, and that's and that's the whole issue. So so in the CBED 2030 project, we've actually tried to define acceptable resolutions and they, they they change as a function of depth because of the geometry of the sonar as as you get further and further away from the bottom the footprint even in the multi-beam gets larger and larger so we've defined a, a series of depth bands at resolutions we'd like to uh, collect data at and it's to be honest mostly defined based on pragmatism it's defined in such a way to ensure that we only have to make one pass. It's going to be so difficult to map the whole world ocean. We don't need to have a resol uh, need to specify a resolution that will take multiple multiple passes to piece together um, higher resolution. So, so our resolution starts at 100 meters um, for 1,500 meters uh, and shallower, and it goes to uh, 200 meters to I forgot I forget the to maybe. 4,500 meters and then 400 meters um, to uh, about 65, 7,000 meters. I forgot the exact numbers. And then 800 meters at the, at the deep in the deepest band, which is the sonars can do better. It's it's just that uh, we want to make sure that um, we, what we call covered. That that's always the question. What does it mean to say you you have the seafloor covered? So we do it at a large enough scale that we think it's 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 uh, it's feasible. Uh, but then I, I, I would, you know, the answer always is as high a resolution as I possibly can get, is what I really want. And let's see, we have a few more here. Um, Dave Sandwell. Oh. Uh, autonomous <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I the autonomous ships me. and arrays of drones are very promising for global seafloor mapping. However, how do we get this funded? We need a NASA for the ocean. I'm particularly interested in the southern oceans. The global coordination seems like the biggest problem. Yeah, no, he, he, Dave is exactly right. I mean, you know, we, we I, I say all these things, but it has to be funded. And that's why we're trying to push technology to make the required funding um, less than three to five billion. If we can bring that cost down by half or half again, we're still talking about something pragmatic. I'd love to see a global, a global ocean mapping program like the global... Uh, like the international drilling program that where people commingled funds and, and set apart to do it. But I don't think it's gonna happen that way. We're starting to see some real, uh, and I dropped those slides, but um, th th there are efforts going on in the North Atlantic. You know, I, I think it may happen through regional consortia. So the, there was something called the Galway Accord where um, the EU, Canada and the US uh, had a, a big agreement about scientific cooperation in the North Atlantic. And uh, that has really gotten some traction, uh, lots of different collaborative projects, but it's recognized at a, at a minister level. And so each one of those countries has in the course of, uh, well, it's been about five, six years now, actually uh, paid for cruises specifically to fill mapping gaps. And one of their goals is to complete the mapping in that region. So I think if we can do it region by region, we have some greater hope, but you're right. The Southern Ocean, a place like that, where, you know, we're kind of it's too far away from anybody to really care about, will will be a challenge. And so we'll we'll have to you know find ways, um, simple as that, and, and also work to make it cheaper so that it's that it's doable. We probably have two more um, time for two more questions and then move over to the social part. So Elliot Smith here. Uh, will these new autonomous vehicles be equipped to do sub-bottom pro profiling as well? Yeah, so that's a, yet another good question. If we looked at, I didn't mention anything about the U.S. actually having a wonderful new uh, thing we call NOMEC, National Ocean Mapping Exploration and Characterization uh, Program. Um, and so there's a charge within the U.S. now to map the U.S. EEZ, not only map, map, explore, and characterize the U.S. EEZ by 2030. And in that definition, sub-bottom profiling is part of it. Um, the sub-bottom profiling, you know, it takes more power and things like that. So if you have a limited power, power issue, um, I, I guess my answer is I'd love to do everything as much as we could every time, always. It's really the trade-offs between 
power weight. And so I'm going to say something that's biased to my own, you know, kind of prejudiced by my own bias. And, and that's that I, I, I've always believed that we need to start with a, a basic map that, that if, if, if it's going to inhibit the ability to completely map the world, I'll start with the map and then figure out where I need to do the more detailed characterization later. Um, but if I can do them both at the same time, I'm all for it. And we have a question by Peter Wertham. Hams, sorry. Um, thanks for mentioning my work. Uh, do you think that AUVs could have a bigger role in detailed mapping of features such as ice underside or seabed small scale features? Should we be looking for vehicles with larger ranges? Yes, and the answer is absolutely, ab absolutely yes. The, the, the issue is speed. You know, they, they still are you know, typically traveling at four, four knots or so. And again, it's the same trade-offs, you know, but again, with new battery systems, we're seeing very long range. Uh, you know, UK has some, the National Ocean Center in the UK has some long range AUVs. Um, so I think, you know, again, technology is, is creeping up on us all the time. Um, and uh, it offers all kinds of new possible solutions. So we should, we should, we should follow all possible leads, but uh, you know, Peter's absolutely right. There's, there's lots more work. The, the problem with AVs is the, is again, if we really want to get close to the bottom to get detail, we just don't cover that much ground. So again, we look for the trade-off. I always say, let's start with the, the global map at hundreds of meter resolution, hundred and then from there, we'll figure out where we put the effort to send the AUVs to do the more detailed prosecution of, of areas. I, I, you know, we, we used to always say, well, so much of the ocean is, is flat and boring. You know, we can skip all that. But unfortunately, as we start looking more closely, a lot of it isn't really flat and boring. There's always something interesting there. It's a thing, isn't it? Um, Helen Fricker has a final comment saying, mm -hmm. NASA Earth Ventures. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what we need. I, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave you all with a question that I've always wondered. And, and, and why, why, why is it that it's been so easy for our politicians um, to, to get the levels, or why is it so easy for NASA to get the level of budget that they have? I, I think I, I've seen, you know, it depends on the year, that, you know, the NASA exploration budget is, you know, you know two orders of magnitude, a thousand times more that was that was it three excuse me see, see, see why I can't go to IGBP um, a thousand times more um, than than NOAA's exploration budget and uh, you know why 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 is it why why is everybody interested in the exploration of space which they should be it's it's phenomenal but but that same level of acceptance and interest isn't there for the oceans well maybe no. that's something we can pick up in the <laughs> social hour it's perfect uh, entree into that. Uh, what I will do is I am dropping again uh, in the chat. You should see a link to the Zoom session afterwards. We're going to give Larry a, a small break. <laughs> uh, Thank you. And we will all meet up there um, and uh, hope to see everyone shortly. It's going to take me a second to go over, but um, get ready. And okay, and thank you so much again, Larry. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I'm not seeing a chat right now. So, not the uh, so I think if I stop sharing the screen, I'll probably see the chat. Okay, is that okay? Go right ahead. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Perfect. That, that worked. Yep. So, and you should also have 